I've got so much to say, I've, I've got to have a laptop to keep track of it. AMD has launched next generation Navi. They're out. You can buy them, at least theoretically, or almost, pretty much, sort of, kind of. Don't quote me on that. The 6800 XT and the 6800 are what is in front of me with the Brobdingnagian Frank GPU coming in uh, December. That's the 6900 XT, we'll talk about that. These are unlike anything that I have ever seen or tested before, and yet, they are impressive for what they are. They're highly impressive. AMD is a worthy adversary, uh, truly an engineering marvel. And we're gonna be comparing these two to the the Zotec 3090 because that's all I've actually been able to buy so far. I've got bots scouring the internet, not like really insane bots. They're they're mostly just shopping bots where I have to like put in my credit card, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. The 6800 is meant to compete with the 3070 and the 6800 XT is meant to compete with the 3080. However, as we're gonna see in the benchmarks, it's not really exactly that straightforward. Talking about GPUs in terms of raw FPS is maybe not the right conversation. There are ar huge architectural changes here, but there's also a lot of driver and software stack changes, and almost all of them are not around more FPS. Instead, it's really about delivering a better overall gameplay experience as the demands of the game vary from scene to scene. So it's kind of obvious though, if you look at it in hindsight, you know, look, look at it in GPUs and games and stuff dating back to 2017 and even before. You know, some reviews at the time for the 2080 Ti in 2017 said that it can comfortably do 4K, meaning 30 FPS in some titles. But now with, you know, modern NVIDIA and AMD cards, we're talking 60 to 90 FPS and extremely high graphical fidelity as well. I mean, uh, if you go back even farther than that, look at the Lara Croft character model in Tomb Raider 20 years ago. She only had about five polygons. But now, now she's got a completely ridiculous extensive subroutine just for handling her hair mechanics. So everything is higher resolution now and higher fidelity. Look at the overall 1080p frame rate though from 2017 till now. The move from 60 to 90 FPS average at 1080p is huge, but from 90 to 120 FPS average at 1080p, it's not, it's not nearly as huge in terms of like actual user experience. It's an impressive benchmark, sure, but moving from 120 to 240 FPS, again, it's an impressive benchmark, but you know, if we can do 120 Hertz at 4K, why can't we do 240 FPS at 1080p? 4K is four times as many pixels as 1080p, and yet we can barely manage double the frame rate. That, that was Jensen's sleight of hand during the NVIDIA 3000 presentation, 8K resolution. Well, it turns out this whole conversation is sort of, you know, turned around backwards. When you want to talk about game fidelity and user experience, I, I would personally rather have a graphics card that has a software and hardware stack for consistency of experience. I'd rather have 90 FPS with no game hitches or glitches or any kind of stutter than a game that averages 10 or 20 FPS higher or 30 FPS higher. I want a game with the fastest load times. I want a game that's the best overall experience. I want innovation in the form of improved total experience and not merely improved FPS. I mean, look at Doom Eternal. Doom Eternal is just, it's a, it's a, it's a marvel of engineering. That game is built like you should build a game. It, it really is a masterpiece of engineering and consistency of execution. It's a joy to play because it's so smooth and consistent and just everybody should look at that as a model. It's like, how do these programmers do that? They did it exactly correct. We're having this conversation about user experience and lag and you know graphics fidelity and all this kind of stuff, but you can't take away from Team Red that it was their teams that brought that conversation to the forefront, talking about lag reduction, variable rate shading, AMD's Fidelity FX and opening that and other technologies that are focused on consistency and performance. And more importantly, it's doing it in such a way that is going to be open for any game developer to adapt or any competing GPU company as well. Smart access memory, something that you only get on the AMD CPU platform currently, but that's probably gonna change pretty quickly, can directly access all GPU memory instead of, for example, going through a 256 megabyte PCIe ROM bar space. But that smart access memory is something that AMD has brought to the table and that we've heard rumor that uh, you know NVIDIA is racing to implement. Now, ray tracing is another technology, and certainly NVIDIA got a lot of buzz for that with RTX, and it is a game changer for increasing visual fidelity. Ray traced Quake 2 blew my mind. 
These cards support DXR or DirectX Ray Tracing, which is sort of the standard that that thing is built. I mean, NVIDIA calls it RTX and you can certainly do some stuff with RTX, but it's DXR under the hood, mostly. Like, it's, that's the industry standard, although you can, we'll talk about that. There are other ways to implement, you know, ray tracing, but trying to contribute positively to the industry is always preferable as opposed to, say, something like Hairworks. Yeah, uh, DXR is probably the future in terms of ray tracing and implementation and certainly, you know, on the console side of things, that's, that's what we see. So, yeah. It's hard to benchmark, though, in any consistent way when we're talking about the visual fidelity aspect of things. We sort of keep going back to this crude tool that is FPS. And also, even though NVIDIA launched with RTX, didn't really have any launch titles for a while. AMD, on the other hand, has launch titles for ray tracing. Dirt 5, Godfall, World of Warcraft Shadowlands, Riftbreaker, and Far Cry 6. Oh, would you look at that? Most of those feature pretty heavily in our benchmarks. Yes, AMD was kind enough to supply us with early access to these games so that we could take a look at this and do some stuff, and, and it's really exciting. But that's enough rambling. Let's get on with the benchmarking. Now, for a Shadow of the Tomb Raider benchmark, astute observers might look at this and say, wait a minute, 166 FPS for the RTX 2080 Ti Founders Edition? Wow. That, that seems that seems low. We did something a little different for this testing. See, I was at Micro Center, I guess it was for the Zen 3 launch, and uh, you know, a lot of people were buying, you know, the middle of the road memory and talking to some of the people there and some of the other stuff, looking at our Amazon affiliate links. Not a lot of people are buying really super expensive, like the CL14 memory or even CL16. So this testing was done with the 3200 CL16, ooh, yeah, that's kind of slow stuff. You can do some tuning and you can get some more performance out of it, but the difference between the very best memory and the very best tuned configuration and the average inexpensive middle of the road, no name brand memory is 166 FPS in, in the, the uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider versus 199. I'd say most people can do about 180, give or take, but that's only at the 1080p resolution. So a little meta experiment for me is to compare these results with uh, some results from other channels, because I mean, obviously we're not known for benchmarking, I don't have time, maybe someday if we get big. But uh, I sort of wanted to look at how much of a performance difference memory speeds would make in things other than 1080p gaming, because that really high return frame rate you know, over and over and over again, really depends on a fast interconnect and low latency between main memory and the rest of the system. So this is sort of a worst case scenario in terms of performance, in terms of your memory speed, at least for 1080p gaming. Although, as you'll see, you know, as you now sort of think back and look and compare, 1440p and 4K makes less of a difference than you would think. As promised, Dirt 5, 1080p, wow. Look at that, the 6800 XT is on top, and the 6800 XT is on top by a wide margin. Look at that, the $1400 MSRP 3090 trailing behind with 78 FPS to the Radeon RX 6800 XT's 100 FPS. This is with ray tracing on. Now this was a beta branch of the ray tracing thing, so take this with a little bit of a grain of salt. I didn't have a lot of time to get familiar with the games and test this and all that kind of stuff. Be sure to check other reviews. I'm not super confident with this yet, but yeah, I mean the 6800 is neck and neck with the 3090. Also threw in a 2080 Ti for good comparison because it's like, oh, this is the, you know, 2080. If you were thinking about buying a 2080 Ti, you definitely, no, no. 63 FPS of the 2080 Ti Founders Edition versus 100 FPS. Now, you step up to 1440p and there's really not that much of a loss in performance or conversely what i was talking about before where it's like mm, it's performance scaling you know team green and team red they uh the you know the performance scaling when you're talking about over 100 fps there are bottlenecks elsewhere but goodness gracious 84 fps for 649 msrp this is on the 5900 extra member and on the ultra high preset well what about 4k the 6800 xt at 4k 50 FPS for our 1% lows and 56 FPS for our average frame rate is pretty darn good. This is a little bit faster even than the 3090. So yeah, Dirt 5 goes toe to toe, 3090 is really, that's genuinely very impressive for these cars, you know, big knobby. Just a couple of months ago, it was like, oh, is it 
anybody going to have anything to, to compete with? You know, on that se September 17th, the launch, it's like, wow, this is going to be a really big hill for AMD to climb with the new NVIDIA launch. But whew, looking at these results, I really think that uh, NVIDIA totally got hair works on this one and the best possible connotation of that. Well, what about with ray? Let's let's turn off D turn off ray tracing. Turn off the DXR. Okay, what are we looking at there? Oh, okay, 112 FPS <laughs> at 1080. Not bad. Still, not quite the scaling I would expect because when you step up to 1440p, we're still at 101 FPS. And 4K, 70 FPS. An imminently playable 70 FPS with minimums over 60 FPS at 4K, no ray tracing. And remember, I'm not really showing you. Uh, smart access memory or rage mode yet because uh, uh, rage mode can let the GPU sort of go all Hulk smash. All right, what about Rift Breaker? Rift Breaker is sort of a newish game. It's a it's a base building survival strategy with action RPG elements. Rift Breaker starting at 1080p on the Ultra benchmarks. It's already a pretty good showing for the 6800 XT, 202 FPS, 164 for our 1% lows, but 233 FPS and 201 for our 1% lows on the RTX 3090. The 6800 is holding its own though with uh, 159 FPS and 132 FPS for their 1% lows. Not bad, not a win for AMD, but still not bad. Especially when you consider the whole price performance ratio or price per watt or performance per watt. When you step up to 1440p and 4K, there's not really a lot of surprises. The 3090 is in the lead with Rift Breaker, but again, these are some really respectable frame rates. The 6800 XT is 59 FPS with 48 FPS for our 1% lows at 4K with ray tracing on, but the 3090 is able to uh, outperform it by quite a margin at 87 FPS uh, average and 72 for our 1% lows at 4K. Genuinely very impressive. Let's disable ray tracing and see what happens. DXR. Oh my goodness, the, the RX 6800 XT jumps up to 558 FPS with 484 as our 1% lows. And the 3090 is a 462 FPS and 394 for the 1% lows. These numbers at 1080p are completely meaningless. Like, I was sort of talking about the 1080p scaling for the earlier graphs and like around 100 FPS. Maybe that has meaning. At 400 FPS, it's completely nonsensical. Moving on. 1440p. We still have 395 FPS for the 6800 XT and 333 FPS for the RX 6800 to the GeForce RTX 3090 performance at 342 FPS. Not really, not a bad showing. At 4K, we're basically neck and neck. The 3090 and the 6800 XT are within margin of error for each other. About 198 FPS for each of these with about 179 on our 1% lows. Maybe the 1% lows are a little worse on the 3090, but I'd say this is probably just down to test bed variation or particular game benchmark or something like that. It's, it's, it's maybe slightly worse for the 3090, but not dramatically so. Borderlands 3. Borderlands 3 is super popular. It's still in, in um, among the most popular games on Steam. And uh, yeah, the performance here is pretty solid. The 6800 XT takes the crown over the 3090 at 163 FPS. The graphics preset was Ultra. Again, this is with our 5900X CPU. Uh, it's, you know, 151 to 163 FPS. You know, that's a few percent better, but the RX 6800 here, I think is the star of the show at 134. Of course, when we step up to 1440p, the conversation changes just a little bit. The performance between the 6800 and the 6800 XT, surprisingly, was basically the same at 101 FPS, with the 3090 taking the lead at 117 FPS. For Borderlands 3, stepping up from 1440p to 4K, the performance is basically equal. 69 FPS versus 70 on the RTX 3090. The RTX 3090 is at 24 gigs of VRAM. The 6800 XT is only 16 gigs of VRAM. <sighs> How is this possible? The 1440p performance on the 3090 was so much better. All right, Far Cry 5. Far Cry 5 is one that I've wanted to talk about for a long time, ever since our Zen 3 launch, because Far Cry 5, the engine, really has trouble struggling, you know, with multiple chiplets and the AMD architecture in general. And this is something that could have been tweaked in the game engine, but they didn't. And so this is one of our sort of worst case scenarios for AMD in terms of performance. Moving from, I mean, if you look at Far Cry, 
5 performance on Zen 2, it was kind of all over the place. And if you played the game, you know, you would get the occasional stutter or something like that. With Zen 3, because of the architecture changes and because of the new Zen 3 cores, we showed that largely that went away. In the GPU benchmarks, this is genuinely very exciting. Starting with 1080p, we're basically tied. The 6800 XT and the 3090 are, are tied at 152 FPS with the 1% lows being maybe maybe a little better on the 6800 XT, with the 6800 coming in at a very respectable 131 FPS. When we step up to 1440p, we're getting 150 FPS, so only slightly reduced performance is suggesting that the bottleneck is somewhere else other than the CPU or the GPU. Where could that be? I don't know. That seems crazy. Uh, the 6800 holds its own at 131 FPS, and the 3090 is basically the same performance at 150 FPS. At 4K, we're talking 99 FPS for the 6800, but here the 3090 pulls ahead maybe a little bit at 104 FPS. This might be within margin of error of this testing. Uh, you know, I, we could call this a push, we could call this a slight win for AMD. It just depends on, you know, what color your beer goggles are. But uh, the performance here is still nothing short of breathtaking. And this is one of the worst case scenario games. All right, let's take a look at Horizon Zero Dawn. This is another publisher that AMD has worked with on making sure that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, which is really important for the gaming ecosystem. At 180 FPS, we're talking 150 frames per second versus 143 from the RTX 3090 and 128 on the RX 6800. Again, an incredible showing, an incredible showing for a sub $600 GPU in that RX 6800. Stepping up to 1440p, it's pretty much the same story with the performance of the 6800 XT and the RX 3090 being about equal. This one may be favoring the RTX 3090 just a hair, but again, within margin of errors, although our 1% lows are notably better. Almost 10 FPS better at around 50 FPS for, the, for that variation. So stepping up to 4K, well, Horizon Zero Dawn of 4K, the 3090 does handle it a little bit better at 81 FPS versus the 70 FPS of the 6800 XT. However, not bad. The 1% lows are markedly better at 38 uh, for our 1% lows versus 25 on the 6800 XT. But still, not bad. I went through my Steam library trying to find as many of the top 100 games as, as I could there. Even games like Monster Hunter World, which was a bundle title for the GTX 10 series launch. It ran buttery smooth. Of course, it has no built-in benchmark, so I just ran around the ancient forest to try to figure it out. The 1440p and 4K performance numbers are impressive. And like all games, the performance doesn't scale linearly down to 1080p. But the performance was shockingly good in Monster Hunter World. And this is one of the least good games that I tested because, you know, it was basically an NVIDIA launch title. Overall, I do find the 6800 XT to be a pretty compelling value over the 30 RTX 3080, at least in terms of performance and features. I didn't find it necessary or even reasonable to run the games at the highest possible graphics settings. You may have seen the AMD press release where they have some graphs and it's, everything's at like ultra. So I wanted, you know, sort of better overall game performance without sacrificing too much visual fidelity. So keep that in mind as you look at my benchmarks. Our test system was an AMD Ryzen 5900X with four terabyte Sabrent Rocket Q4, which is a great SSD. I also tried to include Godfall, but it kept getting stuck at connecting, which made it really hard to, uh, to benchmark, it was really annoying. Um, but I, I'm hoping that I'll be able to include some of that information later. Godfall was another AMD launch title, but to me it's more impressive that the random selection of games that I tried still had consistent and very good performance. You know, sometimes with some earlier launches, the drivers uh, are really the key thing, and the drivers can mean the difference between a win and a loss. I didn't really have a whole bunch of time with these GPUs to do testing, and Linux testing is very important to me, so be sure to check out that Linux video on the Linux channel. But overall, the performance on every game that I tried is insanely impressive. It is, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing that AMD could pull this off. However, there is even more performance on the table. These cards can be even faster. So there's Rage Mode, which is a toggle in the driver. Rage Mode. Uh, you know, it, it turns it on to allow you to boost higher and the fans will ramp. And so you can audibly hear the card ramping a little bit, but it's free performance. And the amount of free performance you get is gonna vary from card to card because Silicon Lottery. But this should be good for a one to 2% performance bump through just about every game. Secondly, there's this smart access memory thing. And, you know, I can't believe that AMD was the first to think of this because, like, if you follow my some of my other content with the whole, like, virtualization and SRIOV, I've run into this kind of thing on 
consumer and desktop motherboards, getting them to properly support SRIOV. You need more PCIe ROM bar space, basically. This just increases the ROM bar region so that the CPU can directly access the full GPU memory instead of paging through it 256 megabytes at a time. AMD shows performance improvements from one to 6% and it is gonna be highly, highly game dependent. So, you know, some games will, will improve, not so much. But we know that AMD's onto something here because Nvidia is apparently scrambling to support the same thing. Hmm. Because of these features, and if you throw in variable rate shading and fidelity FX and, uh, you know, differences in strategies, NVIDIA's DLSS is, is a different thing that kind of does something similar, but it's different. It's very, very hard to do apples to apples comparison testing when visual fidelity enters the mix. So, but for me, I just had to step back and look at this. Look at the plucky little 6800. Look how much performance this card is going to give us for around $600 US. It is insane. Even if a $600 video card is completely way outside your budget, competition this intense is only going to completely upend the lower end of the market. There is going to be a flood of old, used, cheap graphics cards as soon as other people get their hands on this. And availability for this launch is probably a concern. I told, you know, I was told by some con uh, contacts in the retail industry that their stock levels are way better than the RTX 3000 series launch, but nowhere near enough. Nvidia has said they're going to have stock issues through 2021. I've been able to, you know, pick up a 3090 from, you know, but the 3000 series, you know, they launched September 17th and uh, it seemed rushed. Did it seem rushed because Nvidia got wind of what was happening with AMD before all of us? Oh crap, fellas, we gotta get this 3000 series GPU out the door because we gotta work on the next thing that needs to be even faster and have more VRAM. I don't know. Both of these cards and the planned 6900 XT all have 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 VRAM. NVIDIA's 3090 has 24 gigabytes of VRAM, which no doubt helps with 8K and maybe some content production cat, uh, tasks, but the memory in these is only 256 bits wide. Why, you know, some industry pundits might say, oh, that's, that's not really good, but these GPUs also now have infinity cache. 128 megs of cache means that effectively you've got more bandwidth than 384-bit memory. AMD saves on power budget. They save on silicon real estate. The silicon be f can be physically smaller on these GPUs. So in the benchmark of performance per unit silicon, AMD's kind of mocking NVIDIA at this point. I mean, what AMD can do with less silicon real estate, you know, ultimately whoever has the least silicon real estate ultimately wins because the higher your yields will be and the lower your costs will be, all else being equal. Now the raw compute horsepower of these cards with uh, AMD is higher than Nvidia as well. And I'm sure that the cryptography miners will show us that. <laughs> and I would guess that will also be another source of supply constraints. So yeah, uh, might be a little bit rough. The driver stack is probably the weaker part, but from my own experience, this is shaping up to be way better than the 5700 XT launch. Obviously, check with other reviewers and see what others' experiences are. I have a feeling it's gonna be varied, and that's not entirely unexpected. If the software features, smart access memory and the driver stack and all of that stuff ends up being as good as the hardware engineering, because it is truly breathtaking, uh, AMD may be poised for gaming leadership here. That's how good they are. It's, it's kind of shocking. As it is, these products are pricing disruptors. Uh, the next few weeks and a few months are going to be really interesting times in the GPU space. I'm sure these cards are going to be insanely popular. Um, AMD is also launching their cards with their partners. Their, their partners were in step here, maybe a little bit better than for the NVIDIA launch. We're going to see cards from Asus, ASRock, Sapphire, PowerColor, XFX, more partners. Also, this thing has good day one Linux support. But to see that, you're going to have to check out the level one Linux channel link below. And there's so much more we could talk about with these videos, but I'm already running kind of long. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm Wendell. This is level one. I'm signing out and I will see you later. If you pick up one of these, you want to show off your build, come to the level one forums. If you end up being in line at like Micro Center or somewhere like that, uh, post some pictures because probably I'm going to be a Micro Center too. There we go. Now it's the edge of the TV. <laughs>